Sorry. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to our NIE Thursday Night Fireside Chat once again. Um, coming live from our headquarters here in Roosevelt Avenue in Newark, New Jersey. Welcome from the Baker again this evening and all of you at home with your families. Inshallah, tonight's discussion will be talking about increasing our love for Allah. Again, as we go through our discussions, if you have questions, if you have comments, please remember to put it in the chat and um, our producers will ask the questions and we'll get it answered to the discussions. Uh, so we'll dive right in as usual and we'll begin by asking Brother Baker about when we talk about getting close to Allah and increasing our love for Allah, what it means to get closer to Allah. Does that mean as you get closer to dying? Or are we talking about as we live, we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, salatu ala rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa alayhi wa sallam, wa alayhi wa The term getting closer to Allah, uh, it essentially is a condition of the heart. And uh, it's both hoping that you have a good dunya because of the love of Allah as well as a promising akhirah. The hope that everything you're doing will also lead to a good situation in the hereafter. And if uh, why the scholar said that getting uh, closer to Allah is a condition of the heart because the heart in particular out of all of the parts in our body and the creation of the human being, Allah created the heart so that it can be filled with Allah's love only. Only. And the problem that happens is that we wind up filling it with anything, with other things, with the love of an individual. Maybe that's a parent, maybe that's a child, maybe that's a house, maybe that's wealth, maybe that's car, a car or something. We fill it. And the scholar said, when you fill your heart with anything other than Allah, that becomes your ilah. That becomes what you worship. That becomes what you revolve your life around. Some people are so obsessed with work that they are in love with it that uh, that's what's filled with their heart. And if you look, they revolve their life completely around it. They don't revolve their life around the law. Because the scholar said the goal here, and if you look, if you want to understand what this closeness to Allah means, they said, look at how you interact with the different tests that Allah gives you, yeah. that he puts in front of you. When he says, for example, to donate money, and Allah said, the Prophet has clearly told us that the fitna of our ummah is going to be love. When he says to donate, we, come, we, we look for a million excuses to donate. Well, I don't have to donate on that yet because I don't hold it. I don't own this, so I don't do this. We look for so many exceptions. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. One of our teachers, he said that uh, a friend of his is a, um, uh, an accountant in uh, Saudi Arabia. And one of these princes came to him and he said, for example, uh, give me my zakat payment for the year. So he calculates it. He hands it to him. And I, I forget, he told him it was about like three or four million dollars was his zakat that was due. So you can imagine how wealthy this individual was. And he looked at the accountant and he said, and this is the accountant telling you, he says, I, um, I know how to calculate my zakat. He goes, I didn't hire you so you can tell me how to multiply what I own by two and a half percent. He said, I hired you to figure out how I can move things around so it's less. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. Who, who are you cheating? Like we hire this our accountant to pay right? less taxes. Less taxes. Victors and less taxes yeah. with Allah. And who, who are you actually ripping off here? No one. Yeah. This is your zakat between you and Allah. And Allah has just said in the Quran, He said, yeah. That whoever gives, yeah. and the key thing here is also taqwa in Allah, yeah. that you have this consciousness of Allah. That you have also the belief that you're rewarded for it. Yep. Like true belief that what I'm doing is only a benefit for me and also for the sake of yep. Allah being pleased with me in the hereafter. That we will grant him a smooth path. And that smooth path is in this life. You find those people who love to give, they really live very content. They're very calm, they're very at ease, and they're looking to help people all the time. And Allah paves that path for them in the dunya, in this life, and He also paves it for them in the akhirah because part of that reward, you know that, that's when you're going to get it multiplied so many times over. But then Allah follows it up. And whoever withholds, and they think that I'm saving, just he, instead of 100, here's 10, here's a dollar. 
And you're like, reward, what reward? Honestly, you know, I'll just do good and that'll be, I'll live a good life. This hereafter, if it happens, it happens, it's all good. If it doesn't happen, oh well. I lived a good life. You didn't live a good life that Allah told you to live and for Allah. You did it because people, you wanted people to say you lived a good life. You defined that by everything other than Allah. And again, that's what your center point is. That Allah says, فَسَنُوا يَسِرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَةِ We'll pave a path. We'll make فَسَنُوا يَسِرُهُ We will ease his path towards bad. الْعُسْرَةِ Towards torment, towards hardship. Ease it. You made it easy. We'll make that easy for you as well. That you so easily dismiss what Allah is saying. Yeah. This is the consciousness, right? And so when if you want this closeness to Allah, you have to take a moment and empty the vessel. The first thing you have to do is empty of the things that are in there that you put forth. And two of the examples I always like to give uh, is that you look at Ibrahim السلام, and how Allah commanded him to slaughter his son, to sacrifice his son Ismail. There's not a single human being on this planet who is not a prophet that could handle that. Yeah. None. Uh, conscious. There's some some individuals who are doing this for other reasons, but a conscious person, they can't do it. You cannot slaughter your son. And not just that. Ibrahim is an elderly person, elderly, and he waited such a long time to have yeah. children, and now Allah says, testing him. You see? Now here's the thing that we learn. We are the people as Muslimin and Mu'minin, the people of the process. If you truly have a love of Allah, you know that the tests that Allah gives us are only to benefit you. And so he says, this son that you waited so long for, you made dua for, and Allah gave you, sacrifice him, Ibrahim. And Ibrahim even takes the blade and tries to cut the neck of his son, and it was cutting like it was blunt, like it was some smooth device, that nothing would happen. And then Allah provided that ring. People of the process. He trusted that whatever Allah asked him was only for his benefit. How to show you that Ibrahim's heart was complete, only filled with Allah, Allah's love. And the only other example I'll mention before we continue with the discussion is you look at Musa's mother. Yeah. Right? You look at Musa's mother in Surah Taha when Allah Azza wa Jal tells uh, the mother of Musa who's running away from a tyrant, an oppressor, a slave master, uh, a, a psycho killer and murderer. It's the year that he kills boys, newborn boys. This is the years, because he's afraid he had, so he had a dream, he's afraid they're going to overtake his throne, right? His uh, palace and his kingdom. This is the year of killing newborns. And so, he's after her child. And Allah commands her, sends your and put commands him, her. Put, her, put, her, put, her, put, her yeah. put him in the chest. Now, if you ask anybody in 2020, what would a lady fleeing from a psychopath kill him and, and deliver him to the guy trying to kill him? Yeah. Because Allah tells her, put him in the taboo. And then put him in the Nile River. It's just not a smooth river, you know, like the. Yeah. It's the Nile River, one of the most vicious rivers, right? And put her in there, and then he will land at the doorstep of an enemy of his and an enemy of mine, an enemy of Allah. So you're like, well, what am I doing here? And then not just that, Allah just says, and I have encompassed his heart with love for me, and I will watch him with my eyes. Okay? And Allah's gonna look after him. And that is just utter faith and trust and love for Allah. When you love Allah to the extent that you follow anything he tells you because you know it's good for you, that's the key thing. So a lot of times we struggle with coping with uh, orders and uh, obedience to Allah. The Samana wa ta'ala rule, the I hear and I obey rule. But if you truly understand that Allah only wants something good for you, that when he tests you with something, it's not like the tests of your professors where your professor gives you trick questions yeah. and you're not allowed to use, you know, he's looking at you, you're cheating, not cheating. Allah says, He's with you no matter where you are. You see? So, so, but in that process of trusting in Allah and doing the things that he wants us to do, we do it because we know that, that in trusting him is the right thing. What is those steps that the scholars talk about, about getting to that kaboom, that, that, that nearness to Allah, where you have that kind of relationship to kind of give yourself up to the command of Allah? What is that, the, the steps in the process, or three-step process, or whatever it Someone is? Someone mentioned that, yeah. So one of the things we look at is there is a hadith from Abu Dhar, and uh, 
even though it's not a, uh, the, something explicit, but it's implied in the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu he told them about, he said, have taqwa in Allah. He said, have taqwa in Allah. And then he said, and if you sin, not just stay away from the sin, don't do it again, but follow that sin, up, sin, follow it up with a good deed. He said, so you can erase the bad deed. He said, and number three, he said, treat people with good akhlaq and good adab, the creation of Allah. So they said you focus, and we look at what the Prophet was telling us to focus on. He's telling us to focus on, number one, our relationship with Allah. And that is the taqwa in Allah. And number two, that is the relationship between us, ourselves. When you sin, you're only harming yourself. You're harming yourself. And number three, he said uh, uh, treating people with good akhlaq and good adab is your relationship with the Creator. And you need all three of these in order to truly have the love of Allah. The taqwa of Allah, interestingly enough, the scholars said it's not just the obedience to Allah, that because the sami'na wa ta'na, but it's also two other things. It's praising and thanking Allah, and it's also remembering Allah. So the praising and the thanking Allah, a lot of times, us as individuals, Allah, alhamdulillah, allow us to be successful. You're talking about, you're talking about the aspect of gratitude. Yeah. The short of gratitude. When yeah. you said thanking Allah. Yeah, the, the gratitude and also attributing everything that happens in your life in a positive way to Allah. That's coming from Allah. Yeah, because you look at somebody who's valedictorian of their high school, right? Yeah. And I hear this a lot. We tend to say this. Oh, they deserve to get into Princeton. Yeah. Pump the brakes there. Yeah. You don't deserve anything. Because why do they deserve? Yes, alhamdulillah, is it because they're valedictorian? then you should say, alhamdulillah, it is only from the, uh, you know, the blessings of Allah that I was able to achieve this, right? How, how many hurdles could Allah have put in your yeah. way? A uh, death of a family member, uh, being poor, homeless, yeah. and so many other obstacles that may have deterred you from achieving a valedictorian status. Yeah. But you, you, we tend to think that these successes in life, you know, became CEO of a major corporation. Yeah, it's because I worked so hard. No. It's because Allah gave you this blessing. You should thank Allah. And that's where you realize when Allah says that whoever has you thanked Allah has made kufr. That you didn't attribute your success yep. to Allah. We need to shy away from this attitude of he or she deserves that because they worked so hard. There's people who worked harder than you. There's people who came from slums and deserve more than what you deserve. Maybe you were fed with a silver spoon. Maybe they weren't. Is it the neighborhood? Is it not? Is it because the color of your skin where you're already... Uh, starting, uh, you know, behind most people. Yeah. And it's a shame because these are things that are inherent in a society. It's, and it's it's not fair to say it's only in our country. It's everywhere in the world. Yeah. But us as Muslims, we don't look at the sob story. We look at whatever we can do to better our situation. And we are a people of the process. We do, and then we re the result is only with Allah. We don't look for the result. If you, if you work very hard, all throughout your life, and you didn't get to become the CEO of whatever, that's what your goal. Who cares? You should be happy. Does that mean we shouldn't work hard unless we get that? You see, the end result, sometimes we get carried away with it. And we see people when they're down a little bit, and they're not that close to Allah, they go to two extremes. Either one, they leave it completely, and you start seeing people like this, where they'll go on social media and, and you know, pride themselves that I've moved, I'm leaving my hijab, but, 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 but that's yeah. a, that leads me to, to a, a very important question because um, you, you talk about when we don't get what we want, but yeah. also when things happen to us that challenges us. And, and, and people have like big challenges too, right? Absolutely. You know, you look sure. at the crisis, some people are lonely, some people have lost family, Absolutely. some people have lost their income, some people have lost their social life and their friends. and. They're devastated, and a lot of people say, "Well, God has abandoned me." Yeah, right. So, um, how do you get close to Allah when you start to think that Allah has abandoned you? It's because they they filled their heart with anything other than Allah. This is the root cause of it, because all of the scholars said the the if you look at how an individual is always able to stay afloat, you look at how the Prophet said of survived losing his wife, whom he yeah. loved so much how he lost all three of his boys, uh, his children, his uh, infant, at infant age. You look at all of these uh, things that he was tested with and he was still able to uh, persevere in the face of these tests, it's because of the center piece in their life. 
their heart is filled with Allah, with gratitude. Now, given some people may not have been raised that way, so it's not too late for them. Yeah. Because the fact that they are now conscious and they can read and they can learn and they can develop better habits, then you can then remove, start emptying things. Stop, start detaching yourself from people. Why is it that you should only be happy if your spouse is happy? Why did you, why did you make that attachment? Why did you make the attachment that I'm relaxed when I get my bonus and I'm happy, I'm uneasy? It's okay to relax when you get your bonus. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, but that's, that shows you. I mean, it reminds me, it always reminds me of the story of Abu Hanifa, uh, and he was giving a lecture in front of all of his students, right? And he's, a, by the way, if people don't know this, he was very well off. Some people would say multimillionaire. A lot of people don't know that about him. He's a tradesman. And, and uh, in the textile and trade, in the, so, you know, the textile industry. So he was giving a lecture, and one of his uh, employees comes to him in the middle of the lecture, and he whispers in his ear. So Abu Hanifa paused, and he looked down. He said, Alhamdulillah, and he continued with his lecture. And uh, after a, l a long period of time, these ulama used to give lectures. Yeah. They don't have the attention span of us today, yeah. which is, what, two, 20 seconds yeah. Yeah. at this point. Um, and so the, his employee comes back to him, whispers in his ear. He does the same thing again. He pauses. He looks down. And he says, Alhamdulillah. And he continues with his lecture. After the lecture, you know, the students are kind of distracted by that. They came to him. They said, you know, uh, oh, Imam, during the lecture, this happened. You kind of paused for a moment. You looked down both times. And you said, Alhamdulillah, what was going on? He said, my employee came to me. And he knows I'm expecting a very big delivery, a very big shipment. And some of them even valued at a few million dollars. I mean, very, very big shipment. And he said, and I was told that that ship had sunk. Oh, boy. Yeah. So he said, I paused. And he said, I thought about it for a moment, and I checked my heart, and I didn't care. He said, and I said, alhamdulillah, that this dunya didn't even phase me. Yeah. I didn't even glitch, like, oh, my God, my ship, let me go figure. He said, I didn't even care. He said, I didn't care. I said, alhamdulillah. And I... Continue. He said, I checked my heart. I want to see if it was moved. That I lost such a great amount of money. He said, and later on he came back and said, hey, man, great news. It actually wasn't your ship. It was some other ship. Your ship is coming. It's fine. He didn't care either. Because he just won that money. <laughs> it's like you just paying, earned all this money. He said, and I wanted to see. And he said, my heart wasn't moved either. And this really is the example of us having this attachment. And so the fact that we're so excited is something. Yeah. But it's also something we, tr listen, it's, it's, it's a fact that this is the fitna of our own. Yeah. So we have to work on not being excited when it comes. Just say, Alhamdulillah, this barakah came from Allah. This week, this year, the majority of people who get bonuses didn't get bonuses. Yeah. They were lucky to still be employed. Majority. Uh, right? And so you come back full circle and you say, okay, are they not excited? Or should they be excited? Or should they just be mute? No. You should still be excited. Always. Because Allah says in the Quran, in the ma'al rusli yusra, wa in the ba'dal rusli yusra. In every hardship, there's ease. And after every hardship, there's ease. So even in the middle of it, yep. you know when Allah says, that Allah will not burden a soul with more than it can handle. By the way, the scholar said, this ayah is saying that if you pass the test successfully, you're coming out stronger. Mm. And Allah gave you the test so you can come out stronger. Mm. Because He knows you can pass it. Yep. It's, with, with it it's within your reach. So don't Put yourself down. Oh no, this is too difficult. Oh, what are the people gonna think? Oh, this, this, this. No, no, no. But how do you know when you're in the test? Because sometimes you're in the test. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about it. So yeah. afterwards, you're kicking yourself and going, I should have passed it. I should. I could have done better. It wasn't. I could have been better during that process. Yeah. And that's why for us as Muslims, we always live in the moment. We're always in a test. And that's why the third part where the scholar said about the worship and the, and, the, and the love of Allah is about remembering Allah. Because even if you're, even if it seems you're not in a test, you're actually in the test. The good times are a test just as much as the bad times, right? And the fact that we are employed and we're happy, that is a ni'mah from Allah. Did you remember Allah? Or did you kick back and just watch TV and, oh, alhamdulillah, everything's going so smoothly. And you forgot Allah. And you, and you got lazy. And you started, you stopped moving closer to Allah. You stopped praying in the masjid. You stopped go, reading Quran. You stopped fasting, uh, the extra stuff. You know, these things, you have to be very careful of that. You're always in a test. This life is all but a test. What are some of the things that pushes us away from Allah? 
You talked mm -hmm. just now about the three steps of things that um, brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. You know, taqwa, you know, your relationship with Allah, your relationship with your fellow human beings, and yeah, doing good and charity. But what are some of the things that also keeps us away from Allah or pushes us away? The main thing that moves us away from Allah is ourselves in disobeying the minimum commandments, the obligations. Uh, and that is, for example, when you know that something is obligatory and you consciously reject it, this is where the, it's, a, it's a dangerous path. And the scholar said... Well, that, let me, we used to yeah. go, let, let's explain that because people know something. Else. You're talking about my salah, yeah. my zakah, my song, yeah. the obligatory stuff. Yeah. And that's, we tend, that we tend to have, look at the epitome of a relationship with how much beauty there is, how much tranquility, and how much love you have. We all, and that's the equivalent of looking at a gorgeous tower, and you're looking at the top of the tower, but you don't realize how solid the foundation is. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us this exact analogy. He said, Buni al Islam ala khamsa. He said that the foundation of your religion is five. Yeah. The foundation, right? And these five, they, they have branches off of them. So it's funny where you say you see some people where they say, you know, the, the famous question, he doesn't pray, but he wants to fast. Or she doesn't wear hijab, but she throws it on during salat. You, you do, okay, your salat is now valid, alhamdulillah, but your hijab is as much of an obligation as your salat is. You see, when you start picking and choosing when you're going to follow something and in your own, this is what deters you away from the love of Allah. You don't realize that. We have to focus on the foundation. Focus on the foundation. Are you a person who takes your salah seriously? Those people who are just, yeah, well, Lord just kicked in. I got two hours. Well, I'll finish this thing up right here and I'll, and I'll get it done. Allah said, this is the time for salah. This is the time. Unless you're in surgery, unless you're in something that you really can't leave at the moment, what excuse are you going to say when you meet Allah and Allah said, all you have to do is put the computer down. Close the laptop for five minutes. That's it. Go pray and come back, and you'll feel more relaxed, by the way. But the shaitan tricks us. Your salah is the most important. Alhamdulillah, we're all saying the shahada, I hope. Yep. At least some of the viewers were here. If you're not, that's the basis of our religion, is the shahada. You believe in one God, and that all of these messengers throughout time were sent to teach us uh, how to worship God. Same theology from the beginning at the time of Adam until the end of time. Simple. Then our salah, then the sun. There are some people who not just enter Ramadan, but they can't wait for Ramadan to be over. They're actually happy, I'm done with Ramadan, when's the Eid come? That's not the way that we should be looking at it. The zakat, I showed you that example of this brother, unfortunately. And then last but not least, hajj. Hajj is not on the majority of Muslims' minds, unfortunately. They think it's a thing you do when you get old. And that's everything but the truth. Once you reach the age of bulugh, of discernment, maturity, and you, and you have the wealth to do it, you should actually go to hajj. And you shouldn't delay it. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, whoever has the means and the ability to go to Hajj and they don't, he said, let him die as a kafir, as a majusi or a Jew. So if you're not doing the foundational things, you you're not getting up close up. The, the, getting that taqwa with Allah, having that beautiful relationship to get to that uh, tranquility, that you're always content with Allah. Again, you're looking at the top of the tower. You're looking at how gorgeous this monument is, but you're not focusing on how it was founded. And that's the most important thing. And, and part of, of, of the getting the things to build a foundation in, in, in the structure and the demographics of our society today, mm -hmm. um, what role do the circle of our friends or our social interactions or who we hang out with or what's our circle what role does that play in tying us closer to Allah or keeping us far apart? far? Uh, so, uh, the, our environment has one of the biggest effects on us, period. And we learn that from a few things. You look at the hadith of the man who killed uh, 99 people, the psychopath killer, at the time of Bani Israel. And when he finally reaches the alim, what does he tell him? He says, your land and the area that you live in is not good for you to be in. It's enticing you to do all these bad things. He says, move out of this land and go to an area where there's a lot more piety and people who are praying. He said, pray with them and live amongst them and change your ways because he wanted to change his ways. A lot of times we just don't know how. 
So one of the biggest problems we have is negative influencers on us. But then I pose a different question, which the scholars actually said is pretty, pretty interesting. They said in Arabic, a sahib sahib, that a friend is the one who pulls. And aren't you a friend? Why is it that the questioner and the people who ask, and when we have these discussions, we're always looking at ourselves as the influencee? Why don't we ever put ourselves as the influencer? Yeah. Right? Why to create positive impact. Right? Yeah. I mean, the fact that you're listening to this lecture, the fact that we're having this discussion, we want to get closer to Allah. Why aren't you the person in your circle saying, let's get closer to Allah? Yeah. Why did the shaitan trick you all of a sudden and say, no, this circle's bad? Well, maybe it's a good circle. They just haven't thought about anything other than Xbox. And they haven't thought about anything other than just missing Salah and going ice skating and hanging out. Maybe you're the reminder for them. Maybe we should ask ourselves, can we be the positive influence in our circles? And this, this is where the scholars said, if you're unable to, you try and you find your heart swaying towards their things. Yeah. Let's go to Atlantic City for the weekend. Let's uh, look at this girl that I'm texting. Check this girl out. Check this guy out. You know, you find yourself swaying towards their influences. Then you need to find yourself a different circle. We have a question. Yeah, we have one question. So, um, Sister Dion asks, how do we know Allah is pleased with our deeds? And, and so, one of the good question how do we know Allah is pleased with our deeds if you're doing deeds that Allah told you to do if you're doing deeds that the Prophet ﷺ told you to do you know and you must believe because remember the ayah that Allah put a condition you believe in the reward system Allah has told you so if you're doing deeds that you know are defined in the Quran are told to you by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you must believe that they are good deeds. You must believe that these are things that are getting you closer to Allah. You must believe that Allah is pleased with what you're doing. So it's really simple. It's not this um, imagination where I had a dream and the Prophet came to me and says, Allah is pleased with you. No, you know, that's not how it works. Allah gave us the Quran and Allah gave us the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and these are very well documented. As long as that sunnah is authentic, and you know that for sure, then follow it. And you know that that is a deed that is going to be rewarded. The problem that we have is that there are a lot of individuals who are telling you to do things so Allah can be pleased with you, and they just make it up. And I'll never forget this. When I attended Hajj the first time, I was uh, giving a lecture, and then one of the brothers told me, he said, uh, you know, I need to start crying when I make du'a. I said, I don't know what you mean. He goes, just make noises. And I said, I don't understand why I would do that. He said, you know, so the people could get into it. I was so confused. And so later on, I have a discussion with the brother, and he gives me a book, and he says, are you one of the ones who reads Surah Al-Kahf a hundred times in a, in a week? I said, a hundred times Surah Al-Kahf? I said, no, I don't. He said, oh, he said, are you not trying to reach the high level? I said, what level? He said, the level of, of past, like the awliya. I said, who told you that? He said, oh, this shaykh, he had a dream that the Prophet told him, he told him to read Surah Al-Kaf a hundred times. So I paused for a second. I said, oh, I said, I was gonna, but the, uh, it, it was canceled. He looked at me so confused. He said, what do you mean it was canceled? I said, I had a dream. The Prophet told me that ruling's canceled. So I don't have to read it a hundred times. I'm good. So he said, oh, you're making fun of this. And I said, oh, I'm not making fun of that. I said, I had the dream. This guy had the dream. What's wrong with him? I had the dream too. I said, our religion, and this is why I wanted to give him, help him realize what he's saying. Our religion is not based on things that people come up with. This is called bid'ah. This is called innovating. We go with the Quran and we go with the Sunnah. You follow those to the T, the Samana wa Fana. After you do your Fara'id, your foundation, you keep building, you start looking for other things, your adqab. We should all have the, the My Dua app on our phone so that we can look for different things throughout the day. Yep. You know the non-believers used to make fun of the companions? They used to make fun of them. They said, oh look, your prophet even teaches you how to use the bathroom. What, you don't know how to use the bathroom? He says, no. He says, we're now getting rewarded for that while you're not. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that you're conscious that Bismillah, before you enter the restroom, with the left foot, you're being and conscious and you're remembering Allah. You're getting rewarded for that. Something so benign. Yep. 
yet you're getting rewarded for that. You're not missing out on these things, then you keep building, building your relationship with Allah that way with one another. So thank you very much. I think we're winding down um, clearly a very important topic, you know, getting close to Allah subhanahu We talk a little bit about the things and the steps that get us close to Allah subhanahu We talk about all sort of things that keeps you away and focusing on the foundation elements and getting those right. Yeah. And making sure you surround yourself in the circle of people who help you to get closer to Allah. And a very important point is try to be the influencer. Absolutely. Right? Because as trying to be the influencer, you also better yourself in that process and you also improve in that process. So and thank you, you don't abandon the friends that you have. I don't abandon the friends that you have. We talk about that. Um, next week, inshallah, um, we're giving Brother Baker a rest. <laughs> um, he's been going at it for a couple of weeks. He gets a rest next week. So we have our celebrity guest joining us next week, Sheikh. Daoud is joining us next week, and the topic for next week is interesting. So we're going to be doing 10 questions, the questions that you always wanted to ask, but you never ask, right? So not the huge, big, crazy questions, but little things that bother you that you always wanted to ask this question. Send those questions in or call in at the phone number or send it to a friend who can get it to us. And um, we're going to have 10 questions next week. Um, that people always wanted to ask, but they never did. And we're going to ask those questions to Sheikh Dawood next week. He's going to join us. So please remember to join us next Thursday night with Sheikh Dawood for the Fireside Chat. Thank you all for joining us this evening. As always, we wish you um, all the best. Alhamdulillah with you and your family this evening. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a good Friday, a good Yawmul Jummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.